the title of this department reflects very accurately actually our twofold objectives. To facilitate data flows on the one hand for commercial purposes, but also equally for regulatory and law enforcement purposes, um, while at the same time ensuring a high level of data protection. We strongly believe and we also find confirmation in our daily work that developing strong privacy safeguards and promoting the free flow of data are actually complementary objectives. The GDPR, by providing a broad toolbox of data transfer inf inf instruments, reflects this basic idea. These instruments ra range from adequacy findings that you all know, so the official determination that a third country ensures a comparable um, level of protection to contractual tools. And here we have particularly uh, the model, contractual, uh, the model um, uh, contractual clauses and approved codes of conduct. We also have um, uh, instruments for public bodies, which are maybe less of the interest to this audience here, but they exist, uh, such as international agreements or administrative arrangements. Um, and with this broad toolbox that the GDPR provides and, and that we have at, at our disposal, we have in the past few years significantly intensified our work uh, in this area. And we have managed to conclude adequacy findings for several of the, most, um, of the EU's most important trading partners, starting with Japan in 2019, um, with whom we created the most, uh, the, the, lar the world's largest area of free and safe data flows through actually a mutual adequacy finding. And uh, we then um, uh, last year reached similar arrangements also with South Korea and with the UK, of course. We have also recently agreed in principle, and that was already touched upon with the US, on a new framework for uh, data transfers um, between the EU and the US. And we are also still continuing our work on adequacy and we are in negotiations with uh, several, uh, several third countries, uh, in particular in Asia, but also in, in uh, Latin America. And uh, we have also started to look uh, into the possibility of, of having adequacy findings for uh, international organizations, which is uh, something new that the GDPR provides, a new, um, a new tool that didn't exist under the previous framework. And, um, uh, we want to make use of this opportunity as well, given the increase of data flows or data exchanges with international organizations as part of various forms of cooperation between, uh, between member states' authorities, but also uh, with international or with also with EU institutions, for example. Um, adequacy decisions often complement and increase the benefits of trade agreements that we have in place with uh, third countries, and that is, for instance, the case for Japan and, uh, and South Korea, but also um, uh, since last week when, when the EU concluded its, its free trade agreement with New Zealand, um, also, this is also the case for New Zealand. Um, one benefit of adequacy decisions that is maybe a bit less known to the public um, is that the benefit actually goes beyond data transfers with the EU. And that is because many um, non-EU countries that have data transfer rules on their own, in their own system, for instance, Argentina, Colombia, Israel, Switzerland also, they, uh, um, or the UK also, um, they recognize that countries and territories for which the Commission um, has adopted an adequacy finding also offer an, um, um, also offer, an, so countries for which the, UK, uh, the, the Commission has adopted an adequacy finding that they are also recognized under their own transfer rules as providing an adequate level or uh, a sufficient level of protection. And in practice, that means that a country that is recognized as, or, or that benefits from an adequacy finding by the Commission, so for instance, uh, as an example, uh, Korea simultaneously enjoys the, the free flow of data with a broad network of countries around the world. And so this is what we usually refer to as, a, as the network effect of, of adequacy decisions. Um, beyond adequacy, some of our instruments for data transfers are met with great interest by our international partners and have in several cases been taken as a reference to develop similar mechanisms. And that is in particular the case for model data protection contracts similar to the EU standard contractual clauses that have been developed by a number of countries. And we've uh, just heard about in, in the previous session about the, the, uh, the model clauses that have been developed by ASEAN. And that is a very good example, but they have also been developed by other regional um, organizations, for instance, the Ibero American Data Protection Network. And for us, that is a very, uh, very important and very um, 
yeah, very positive development um, because model clauses actually help to overcome limitations to data transfers that stem from differences in the level of protection between countries so um, um, that are sort of stem from the law in the country and, and they can then build conver convergence at a, at a contractual level by creating a self-standing data protection regime that is independent from um, uh, or that sort of does not necessarily require full convergent at country level. And so that for us, for that reason, we believe that model clauses actually have a huge potential to facilitate data flows globally. And um, we also observe that there is considerable con convergence among model clauses that have been developed. So um, uh, yeah, in, in regional but also at country level. And that should help companies in their global operations. And it also provides a good basis for further alignment of the various models. And that's something that we are uh, working very actively on.